Morning, everyone. We could start with uh, what is potentially mortgage misery for millions of homeowners who are due to remortgage or who aren't on a fixed rate deal. Three lenders have already withdrawn products. It follows the Chancellor's mini budget that was anything but. That spooked the markets and caused the pound to plunge. Today, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, will reveal how he would tackle the current cost of living crisis, with some investors fearing interest rates could peak at 6% next year. The UK's largest, largest mortgage lender, Halifax, has withdrawn mortgage deals instead, offering arrangement fees in return for lower interest rates. Virgin Money has temporarily withdrawn all mortgage deals for new customers. And so has Skipton Building Society. The Bank of England stopped short of announcing an interest rate hike yesterday, but some investors fear interest rates could peak at 6% next year. The Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, is due to set out a medium-term fiscal plan, explaining his thinking on the 23rd of November. Here in Liverpool at the Labour conference, the Keir Starmer will today deliver his big ideas on how to save the country. He's channelling the former Labour Prime Minister, Sir Tony Blair, saying his party is the political wing of the British people. The Labour conference, though, taking place against a backdrop of striking dock workers, bringing back echoes of the past. So ferry, cross the Mersey, and always take me there. The middle of the 20th century and Jerry and the Pacemakers were one of the big names on the Mersey beat scene. Liverpool was famous around the world for its thriving musical influence. Probably best known was this group, John, Paul, George and Ringo, better known as the Beatles. From humble beginnings, they went on to be richer than their wildest dreams. But as their careers soared, the city's economy was faltering. Key employers leaving, docks closing, and inflation on the rise. When you walk through a storm. Half a century later, the city has enjoyed massive regeneration. But as with the rest of the country, once again, Liverpool faces grave challenges today. Dock workers on strike, cost of living challenges, and the third most deprived region in England. And now concerns that the energy crisis is leaving many families unable to heat their homes this winter. And it's against this backdrop that Labour has brought its conference to what was once described as the New York of the Northwest. But what does Sir Keir Starmer need to do in the coming weeks to prove that he has what it takes to unlock the door to number 10. I always wonder who the first person to put the padlocks on. Well, that's a great question. And uh, as you can see, <laughs> where Streeting is here with us, the Shadow Health Secretary talking about those locks there. I mean, what does Keir Starmer have to do to unlock the door to number 10? I think turn the anger and frankly discuss with the Conservatives into a positive appetite for Labour. And that's what this week's conference is all about, because the Labour Party conference is one of those weeks in the year, one, actually a rare week in the year in terms of the coverage we get, where the voters can look through the window, judge whether we've got our house in order, and listen to the offer we're making to the country. And I think last year, in terms of the changes Keir made to the Labour Party, people could see he was getting the house in order. I think what you're seeing this year, and you'll certainly get from Keir Starmer's speech late this afternoon, and you got in, in bucket loads from Rachel Reeves yesterday in her speech, as I hope our country's next Chancellor, first woman Chancellor, uh, you know, we've, we've gone further. We're ready to get the country back in order because on so many fronts things are broken, whether it's the economy, our public services, the sense of law and order in our country, and Labour has serious people with a serious plan to get Britain working again and to give Britain the fresh start it needs. How much has he rewritten his speech? Uh, I, I think all of us, are frankly, are still recovering from our jaws hitting the floor last week with that budget from Kwasi Kwarteng and the real-world consequences we're seeing overnight. The withdrawal of uh, mortgage products tells us uh, about the extent to which the Chancellor, our own Chancellor in this country, has frightened the markets and, 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 and as a result, lenders having to change the offer they're making to consumers. This is just the tip of the iceberg. If interest rates go up in the way that some people are predicting, that's going to be huge additional cost to people with mortgages. And, and what was the Chancellor's answer yesterday? Don't worry, folks. In November, 
I'm going to come out with some new fiscal rules, i.e. I've ignored all the ones I've already got and I'm rewriting the rules and making it up as I go along. This isn't serious leadership. It's a reckless gamble. And as Rachel Reeve said yesterday, it's not the Chancellor or Liz Truss that are going to be paying the price for this. He's gambling with other people's money. And we're seeing the consequences for that in real-world consequences right now, which will affect family finances in the middle of a cost of living crisis. And in answer to my question, how much has he rewritten his speech? Um, look, um, I I'm, I've not been looking over his shoulder. Um, I'm sure he's talked to you about it. it yes, he has. And um, I think the fundamentals remain the same. Our analysis of where the country has gotten wrong, it, 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 you know, it, it, it's not new. We've had 12 years of this now, 12 years of the Conservatives making reckless short-term economic decisions, which haven't worked, uh, making decisions which are short-termist in public services, which means they're now largely broken, and reckless short-termist decisions, which mean that you know, a whole range of things that really matter to people. Yeah, but to Britain clarify, simply isn't working. the leader must have rewritten his speech in order to uh, take in what's happened of with, course the, you, with the pound and uh, also of with the budget. Yeah, of, 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 of course. But uh, you know, we're determined to make sure at the next election we've got a serious plan that is both, I guess, radical in its ambition but okay. also reassuring because I think people need to know that there are still some serious grown-up people in Westminster, that there is a serious alternative government available and we're used to sort of left-right divides in, in politics and some of the conventional um, choices that people always have between Conservative policies and Labour policies. We've now got the central dividing line, which is also responsible Labour versus irresponsible Conservatives. What are we going to do about people who want to borrow money to, uh, for a mortgage? You know, the three lenders are already withdrawn. I'm guessing that is just the tip of the iceberg. What yeah. would you say to them? Um, I'd say the cavalry is coming with Labour. On, on two fronts. That's one is potentially two years away. One people is, are worrying about their mortgage uh, yeah, tomorrow you know, and the uh, next and, day and, and the day after yeah, that. And, and that. So what are you saying a, to the lenders and this that's morning? A, that's a, that, and that's a fair challenge. But also, Kate, that's the one we're answering at this conference. You know, why is it frustrating for me being on your programme as an opposition politician? Because we we can oppose, we can criticise, we can challenge the government. We're not in the driving seat making decisions. We've had enough of that. And I think you've seen at the Labour conference this week a real change in tone, in emphasis, in optimism, a seriousness about the Labour Party and a determined to earn people's trust. But let's talk about the viewers trust. that are watching this morning. Lenders, you, you potentially could be in power in two years' time, is what you're saying, what you're hoping. These people, will, these lenders will have to work with you then. Yeah, that's right. So what are you saying to them now? So two things. One is Rachel Reeves set out yesterday, we've got a serious economic plan to provide certainty and stability for business investors, to restore consumer and business confidence. I think people look to Rachel Reeves, not as the shadow chancellor, but as the chancellor our country needs. I think that's the first thing. That provides the conditions for a stable housing market. Secondly, grasping the nettle of reform we need in the housing market, what's one of the primary things we need to do? Address housing supply. So building more homes, homes to buy, homes to rent, affordable homes, that would make an, an enormous difference. What about today and tomorrow and the next day? What are you saying to the lenders? Well, I'd say to, I'd say to the lenders, I, I appreciate the Conservatives have made your job so much harder. I appreciate you need to revise the products that you're offering consumers as far as you can. You know, remember the fact that just over a decade ago that the country helped financial services out of the massive black hole they'd dug themselves into. In so far as you can, with the conditions the Conservatives have given you, please do your best to look after consumers at this time. Think about those families that are worried about their mortgage payments, really want to get on the housing ladder, have been scrimping and saving to get that first deposit, to get on that first rung of the housing ladder, and now can see that dream of home ownership slipping away. Do your best to support those families. But my, my central message, because I'm not interested in opposition, uh, and, and what we're saying today, I'm interested in what we want to do after the next election. The cavalry is coming with Labour. We've got serious people with a serious plan that would make an enormous difference to families right across the country and to businesses who are the backbone of our economy and will be the bedrock of economic growth. I heard um, the boss described as um, Tony Blair 2.0. Is that a compliment or an insult? Well, look at Tony Blair's record of winning elections and delivering real change in our country. I think... And I you know, put it this way, I, I've been a long-standing fan of Keir Starmer. If you told me when he was first elected leader of the Labour Party that he would have taken us from that crushing defeat in 2019, worst defeat since 1935, to a position today, looking at some of the opinion polls where we're sort of, you know, I, I think kind of double-looking as Labour politicians, thinking, you know, 
look at these polls, look at what it would deliver. Remarkable transformation. I guess the one thing I do want to say, though, to your viewers in the context of those polls is two things. One, we're not taking any voters for granted. We're going to work hard to earn people's trust. Um, and two, we're not relying on the Conservatives to fail to be in government. We've got a positive, serious alternative to offer the country. And at the next election, I don't want people to vote for Labour as the least worst option. I want people to go to the ballot box voting to give change a chance with Labour with the hope, belief and conviction we can deliver real change for people across our country. What a problem you're going to inherit, though, when it comes we to are. the economy of the country. And that's why, Kay, you know, often change is the biggest risk and people are sometimes frightened so of change. tax up straight away, wouldn't you? But, but risk... Oh, I'll come to the point about tax. Make, let me make this point. The risk now for our country isn't change with Labour, it's continuity with the Conservatives. And on taxes, we have made the running uh, against the Conservatives on personal taxation. I don't think national insurance would be reversed. I don't think the basic rate of, of income tax would be being cut without Labour making a real run on the argument that says Conservatives have gone for the pockets of working people as the first so and last resort. Um, well, you saw yesterday from, La from Labour, from Tell Rachel Reeves, um, that serious plan for economic growth, uh, which would inject both long-term growth in, in the economy whilst at the same time delivering the, you know, against the big challenge of our time in terms of climate change. You know, there's, there, there's there won't a serious be an economic there won't, plan yeah, there. there won't be an increase in, in, um, base, in upper rate tax, though, back to 45 Top or higher. Top rate of tax we're bringing back. Do you know what we're going to do, which I'm cock-a-hoop about? Um, serious workforce plan for the NHS, the biggest expansion of staff training in the history of okay, the, the NHS. The reason I ask you about 45% because it's actually only about, it only costs about £2 million, which is a drop in the bucket compared to the problems that but, you'll be inheriting. But here's the thing, Kay, especially when people say, oh, top rate of tax, you know, what difference would that really make in terms of public £2 finances? Billion pounds. I am now able, as I think the country's next health secretary, to double the number of medicine training places at university, to have an additional 10,000 places for training for nursing and midwifery uh, uh, places, double the number of district nurses, put 5,000 more health visitors into the health service. A serious long-term workforce plan so that we can arrest this decline in the NHS. But that's nothing to do with Get what we were just talking it. about with the £2 billion. But that's what I'm spending the £2 billion on. You know, Rachel, Rachel, and let me tell you, uh, on behalf of the rest of the shadow cabinet. Well, two trillion it's not pounds easy, in debt. It's not easy getting money out of Rachel Reeves because she wants to make sure that every penny is well spent. She tests our assumptions and our demands. And, 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 but that £2 billion, do you know what that would deliver? It would deliver the bedrock for the, for the rebuilding and renewal of the NHS for the 21st century. It will also help the economy. There are a quarter of a million people... How would you start to pay off our debt? Because I'll tell you why, Kate. Because there are a quarter of a million people in our country who are economically inactive for no other reason than they are sick and they are tired of waiting. If we get those people treated faster, um, we get those people back into the labour market, that's one of the drivers of growth. If we invest in the way that Rachel outlined yesterday, uh, in the new industries of the future, um, in a plan to put you know, new industry, new jobs in parts of the country that have been de-industrialised and left behind for too long, that's how you get growth into the economy. You don't get growth in the economy by letting you know, boom time for bankers and abolishing the cap on bankers' bonuses. You don't get growth in the economy by making a corporation tax cut you do for the you're biggest corporation. You do if you're a government, that's what they say. Well, we'll I'll tell you what, we'll look at the numbers, Kate, well, but I'll tell you what... Actually, what does it say while we're about talking about numbers, I'm looking at the latest opinion poll, Labour 17 points um, in the lead, but when it comes to who would be the better Prime Minister, uh, the latest poll that we've got, Redfield and Wilton Strategies, they say 40% say Liz Truss, 36% Keir Starmer. And that's why we're not taking people for granted. We know we've got more to do to turn disaffection with the Conservatives into a positive option for, for, for Labour, but it goes back to the point I made earlier, really. If you'd have told me when Keir was first elected leader of the Labour Party that he'd be able to grip this party and make it serious and, and fit for government in such a short space of time, I wouldn't have believed no, you. I'm not sure that. even Keir would have thought in his wildest expectations. I understand that, but the, the last hundred polls, Labour has been ahead in almost all of them. But when it comes to the actual leader, he's not. He's not. It's, they, they think that Liz Truss, who a lot of people think that uh, is mismanaging the economy, is still a better Prime Minister than Keir well, Starmer. Well, let me talk directly to those voters who haven't made their mind up on Keir Starmer. Well, they have made their and talk, and talk about that. Well, Polls change and can be changed. So let me talk to those people who haven't made their mind up about Keir Starmer. The Keir Starmer I work with is serious. 
He's got serious experience outside politics. He does his job seriously. I think he'd be a serious prime minister. Secondly, the Keir Starmer I know is in touch with the concerns of ordinary people across the country. Wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His family aren't particularly wealthy in terms of his immediate family. And, you know, he Neither understands the pressure that people he understands the pressure that people under. But thirdly, and in stark contrast to Liz Truss, he has got the answers that our country needs, whether it's rebuilding economic growth rebuilding our public services, um, rebuilding a sense of hope and optimism about the future, rebuilding Britain's place in the world. You're right, if we win the next general election, Labour will inherit crises on all fronts, crises at home, crises abroad, cr um, crises in terms of the economy. Now, some of those things, like the war in Ukraine, are beyond the control of this Conservative government, uh, and, and I wouldn't blame them for that. But there are a whole load of problems that are made in Downing Street. And after 12 years of Conservative government, asking this lot to fix those crises they've created is like asking the arsonist to put out the fire they started. It's not going to happen. Quick thought before I let you go on the Liverpool Dockers. Are you going to join them on the picket line? Uh, no, we're going to do one better, actually. We're going to deliver a Labour government that improves the fortunes of working people across the country. That's, That's potentially our job. in two years' time, but That's you won't join job. them on the picket line. That's our job. No, I want to be in government. I want to be solving problems. I don't want to be out on, on the streets protesting. I've had enough of that. I did that when I was involved in student politics. I've done that for years as a Labour Party member. We are tired of protesting. We are ready to govern. Okay. That's how we make a difference for working people. Final question. Should Jeremy Corbyn get the whip back? No, I don't think he should. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Bear with us one second. Sadia standing by outside um, several estate agents uh, in South London. Maddie is with us on the floor of the city. Hello to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Let's go to the city first of all. Um, how's the pound doing this morning? Morning, Kay. Well, it was a less torrid night for the pound, less drama today. The pound stabilised um, against the dollar in overnight trading in Asia to about $1.08. That's up about 1.2% where it closed last night. Um, although, let's not forget, last week, before the mini-budget, it was trading at $1.14. Um, the pound also up a smidge against the euro at about €1.12. Um, that doesn't mean it's all over, though. So that's obviously still down on last week. And investors still not convinced by the government's huge tax cuts and economic plan. Um, we will see this lower, lower trading volumes overnight. We will see what happens when markets open shortly this morning. But today, Kwasi Kwarteng is meeting the big banks today to try and reassure them. That's despite the statements yesterday released by the Treasury and the Bank of England, hoping to calm those market fears. Didn't quite have the effect they hoped for. Um, but it's described to me, Kwasi Kwarteng's sort of reassurance drive now, as trying to put the pin back in a grenade after it's been taken out. So certainly we will see what happens when markets open shortly this morning. OK, thank you. Sadia, as I said, is uh, at an estate agent in South London for us this morning. Hello to you, um, Sadia. I wonder what the housing market is going to do, given what we're hearing about lenders already withdrawing their products. Well, the markets have been in turmoil since Kwasi Kwarteng announced his plan for the economy last week. And this is being described as the real-world consequences of that volatility with people with mortgages or people looking to get mortgages uh, having fewer options to choose from. As you say, three lenders have withdrawn some of their products. So what are they? I'll just go through them with you. Virgin Money have withdrawn Virgin Money mortgage products temporarily for new customers. They say existing applications will still be processed and no changes to existing customers. Halifax is withdrawing products that come with a fee, so that's where um, borrowers could pay a, an arrangement fee in exchange uh, for lower um, interest rates. And the Skipton Building Society has withdrawn all of its products, uh, it says, to reprice, uh, again, because of this turmoil, and it says that there are no uh, changes to existing customers or existing applications. And Skipton and Virgin have both said that they expect to launch new product rates uh, in the next few days. But this will, of course, have a knock-on effect, uh, not just on home buyers and people with mortgages, but also businesses like estate agents, like the one I'm outside today, uh, and mortgage brokers who, of course, facilitate these transactions. OK, ladies, thank you both for the update. I'll be back to you in the next hour. Thank you for now.
Tamara's here with us. Hey, good morning, good morning. Uh, what do you make of what West Streeting had to say? Well, he said the cavalry are coming in terms of the message to mortgage lenders and indeed the public about the possibility of a Labour government. And as we wait for the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, to give his big speech this afternoon to the conference here in Liverpool, setting out his stall as the next Prime Minister, he could not in his wildest dreams have predicted this set of circumstances. Labour with a 17-point lead uh, in a poll by YouGov this morning biggest lead for 20 years and this unprecedented turmoil in the financial markets which Tories are now openly saying they are deeply concerned about and whether the government can keep hold of its reputation for economic credibility. Keir Starmer will be saying today that it's Labour who are the party of sound money and it's the Conservatives who have squandered that reputation. I think we're going to hear a very confident speech from the Labour leader, more so than we've heard in previous years. Hastily, as... Interesting that it was hastily rewritten. Yeah, he's he has been talking in the last few weeks about how the real battle is now on the economy, but given the events of the last few days, I think rewrites were going on uh, till quite a late stage yesterday. This is Keir Starmer's opportunity to say, if you vote for change with the Labour Party, they will get us out of this mess, in his view. He had Labour insiders yesterday saying that he relishes the challenge of the economy, battling with Liz Truss on policy, not, as with Boris Johnson, on sort of personality and integrity issues. This is his opportunity today, and as a senior Labour figure was saying to me last night, it now feels like the next election is his to lose. We've seen that happen before, though. Have we not? It's good to see you. Thanks, uh, thanks so much indeed, Tamara. Tamara with us, of course, throughout the morning. Um, looking at the morning's papers for you, and many of them leading with the ongoing market turmoil triggered by the Chancellor's mini-budget. The I reports that some mortgage lenders have stopped offering new home loans, with others expected to follow suit. The Telegraph has the same story on its front page, with the headline, Spooked lenders ditch new mortgages in pound chaos. The Times leads with the Bank of England's response. It says it won't hesitate to raise interest rates after a day of turmoil. The Guardian claims Liz Truss's economic strategy is unravelling as the sterling crisis deepens. Out of control is the headline in the Daily Mirror as the Conservative Party's mini-budget continues to be under scrutiny. While the Mail blames speculators for the plunging pound. And you can watch the Labour leader's speech in full on his plans for the economy live from 2pm this afternoon here on Sky News. Still to come this hour, though, amid fears President Putin could be preparing to formally annex large parts of Ukraine, speaking to a former head of the British Army, General Lord Dannett. As the falling pound puts further pressure on household budgets, I'll talk to the chief exec of the Resolution Foundation think tank, which focuses on improving living standards for those on low to middle incomes. And on the fringe of the conference here in Liverpool, speaking to Labour for a Republic about why they want to see the monarchy replaced with an elected head of state. Before that, there's some of today's uh, other news for you. Uh, starting with Ukraine, there are fears that President Putin could be preparing to annex large swathes of Ukrainian territory, with referenda on joining Russia being held in four regions set to end today. The referenda, which are not recognised under international law, are taking place in the Russian-controlled parts of Luhansk and Kherson and in occupied areas of Donetsk and Zaporizhia. By making these regions part of Russia, President Vladimir Putin could claim that any attacks on them by Ukraine are a direct attack on Russia. Our right, international correspondent Alex Rossi is with us now live from Moscow this morning. Hello to you, Alex. We were chatting about this yesterday, weren't we? And then, of course, we've seen uh, these attacks, I think 17 in total now, on these conscription offices. Uh, the president mobilising more troops into Ukraine. Yeah, there's kind of, Kay, a, a twin strategy going on with the Kremlin for Ukraine. It's desperate at the moment. Its uh, forces have lost the initiative and they have lost the momentum in the face of Ukrainian counter-offensives. First of all, there are what they are calling uh, referenda going on. They are referenda in name only. The international community has described them as a sham. They're being carried out under occupation, under the barrel of a gun. But those are due to finish today. What it will mean is that President Putin could 
formally annex those territories so that they become part of the Russian motherland. It would mean that those territories would then fall under the military doctrine of the entire country, including uh, the nuclear umbrella, which would be an escalation and would be allow him to prosecute this invasion under Russian law more forcefully. Now, the other problem he has, of course, is the manpower issue. And this goes to what we're seeing at these enlistment centres. I think more than 20 actually now uh, have been firebombed. We've seen pictures circulating on social media of uh, protesters throwing petrol bombs at these recruitment centres. This has been ha happening across the vast expanse of Russia. We've also seen protests as well, Kay. Now, these have been very small, but they have been taking place everywhere in the Far East, in the South, in places like where I am in the capital, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. And the fact that they are happening at all, even though that they are small in a police state, is significant. It suggests that um, this policy, he's called it a partial mobilization, but to everybody else, it's mass conscription, is profoundly unpopular. And those protests uh, could get a lot worse. Now, the key thing to look out for is probably what happens, obviously, with the results of these referenda or these sham referenda. That, I think, is a foregone conclusion. All of those votes will be returned that those areas under occupation will want to join up with Russia. The next thing to look for is probably on Friday, where President Putin will address the parliament. And it's quite possible, certainly the UK Defence Ministry thinks he may formally announce annexation of those areas then. And remember, we've seen this movie before. In 2014, he did a similar thing in Crimea. Crimea, of course, now coming under Russia. It's part of the Russian territory as far as the Kremlin is concerned. And winter's coming, of course, Alex, isn't it? Uh, that certainly changes the dynamics of any war on soil in Ukraine. Yeah, that's right. I mean, battles are fought over uh, space, territory and time. Now, if that territory becomes uh, bogged down, as we know it will do in the next month in Ukraine, it could stall the fighting and make things much more difficult. Now, it's why there are two battles going on in Ukraine which are important to look for. One is in Bakhmut in the Donbass and the other is in Lyman. The jockeying strategically for those positions will be extremely important who ends up holding them. Uh, at the moment, Ukraine has Bakhmut. It's trying to get Lyman from Russian occupation. If it can do that before winter comes and the territory becomes boggy, it will be significant because it will mean it will set itself up for when the ground thaws to launch an even bigger counteroffensive. So those are the things to lo look out for on the battlefield in the coming weeks. OK. For now, thanks so much indeed. Thank you. Joined now by the former head of the British Army, that's uh, General Lord Dannett, of course. Hello, my lord. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. I'm guessing you would concur with what we've just heard there from Alex about the dynamics changing uh, when winter comes. Uh, yes, that's uh, absolutely right. Um, there is a certain amount of uh, understandably sort of frantic action going on at the present moment to try and get into a good position before winter changes the dynamic, changes the mobility factions uh, um, or characteristics of, of the battlefield. But I think as you're covering more generally, the wider issues are the ones probably of greatest concern at the present moment, um, issues such as the referenda going on in those four, four areas. Um, and also, I think, looking at it most broadly, the difficulties that Putin is coming under uh, the adverse reaction to his mass conscription. So there are many areas to watch, not just the battlefield at the present moment. Of course, and I wanted to come on to both of those points, um, if you'll indulge me. Let's start with the referenda. First of all, um, four areas that are being uh, impacted by this, illegal under international law, but of course the annexation of Crimea was also uh, illegal. How do you see that referenda and its obvious outcome panning out? Well, I think there are two obvious points to make. One is that Putin will claim that the people in those four areas have now spoken um, with their own voices and they want to be part of the Russian Federation. He will say that. Uh, the West will completely reject that. Uh, we know, because there's no independent uh, monitoring of the elections, that uh, they are sham, that they are false, uh, they are purely a ploy by him. So I don't think that will actually change anything on the ground. I think the concern is the extent to which Putin might choose to back up his rhetoric that in saying that those four areas 
uh, have chosen to join the Russian Federation, that, that they, the Russians, will defend those areas with all means possible. And that brings back the veiled or not so veiled threat of, of the use of nuclear weapons. And that obviously is concerning. And all the way through, we've known there's been a nuclear shadow over this, which Putin from time to time refers back to trying to put uh, a threat, a, a fear, understandably, in, in the West. Uh, in my experience, if a man says I'm not bluffing, he usually is. What did you think? Well, if it wasn't true, they wouldn't deny it. I know exactly what you mean, Kay. I think the thing is that the Americans and NATO are quite wisely saying, all right, yes, you can make your bluffs, you can make your threats, but we have hitherto not seen highly sophisticated and highly capable conventional weapons. And if you use some kind of nuclear weapon, yes, we, of course, we've got the option of responding with a nuclear weapon, but we have got conventional weapons of huge power that actually could be visited upon you. Um, if I was in one of the Black Sea Fleet ships at the present moment, I wouldn't go to bed at night in my bunk very calmly at night. Uh, it's quite possible we could sink that complete fleet if we chose to do so. Oh, um, that's, uh, that's, that's quite the thought, isn't it? Talk to me about the um, part mobilisation that we're hearing about. We've also heard that conscription officers uh, have been uh, targeted, at least 17 of them so far that we know about, according to Russian media, so maybe there are even more. Uh, part mobilisation at the moment, um, I'm guessing that could increase further. Well, hitherto, the war at home in Russia has been somebody else's problem. It's been the problem of the of the regular army, if you like, with those uh, who have been conscripted in the course of the last 12 months in the normal course of events. Now, with his decision to go for a partial mobilization, although actually it's rather more than that, they are pretty desperately trying to conscript anybody that they can. Um, and the talk of calling up reservists is pretty false. It's frankly just a, an effort to harvest as many men as they can and put them in uniform. That process has now made it not somebody else's war, it's made it everyone's war. And the Russian people are, not entirely, but many, many Russian people are reacting adversely against it. I mean, you've only got to look at the pictures of the queues for people trying to get into Georgia, uh, not, to, not to mention the attacks, as you just suggested, on many recruitment offices. This is deeply unpopular, and the unpopularity and the fact that it's affecting many people is now hitting home to ordinary Russians. So Putin has got an increasing problem at home of his own making. Um, <clears throat> did he have any alternatives? Actually, probably not, because for the casualties that they've taken, killed and, and wounded, he was running out of manpower, just as he's probably running out of virtually everything else to do with his military. He's not going to give up. He's going to double down. And this double downing is... Uh, it's, well, the conscription uh, and the, and the ho hoovering up of people to go into his military is causing him an increasing problem at home. It may well be his uh, Julius Caesar moment. But also, um, you know, I, I, I did say, you know, if a man says he's bluffing, uh, not bluffing, he normally is. But equally, uh, if he is painted into a corner, we should be anxious about that. Uh, yes, we should. Um, but there, as I suggest, there are many dimensions to this. It's not just pressure he might think he's putting on us. It's real pressure on him. And it's also people in Russia uh, looking at him, not just those who are against the war. <clears throat> there is an even more radical element that actually is against Putin because they think he's conducted the war so badly. There are sort of ultra-nationalists who may well decide the time has come for a palace coup to get rid of him because he has done so badly and, frankly, is an embarrassment. Um, of course, if that were to happen, it does beg the question, if Putin was to go, who would follow? And would that person be any better? Disappointingly, the answer is probably not. Um, it's always good to see you, my lord. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks, Kay. Looking at other headlines for you now, live here in Liverpool. Uh, four people have been arrested after fights broke out between German football fans and England supporters last night. The Metropolitan Police said around 100 men approached a pub near Wembley two hours before kickoff and started to assault customers. Although some of the group were wearing England hats, police said they are believed to be German fans. England drew their final game before this winter's World Cup last night. Gareth Southgate's side came from 2-0 down to lead Germany, but conceded a late equaliser to draw the game. 3-0.
Hundreds of workers at the UK's largest container port will stage another strike today in a dispute over pay. 1,900 members of the Unite Union at Felixstowe are expected to walk out until the 5th of October. The union says the 7% pay rise imposed on them is a real terms cut due to the rate of inflation. Hurricane Ian is on track to hit Cuba and Florida over the next few days, with officials warning residents to take the Category 4 storm very seriously. Several oil companies, including BP and Chevron, have shut off oil production in the Gulf of Mexico. King Charles' new monogram has been released, consisting of the monarch's name and title. The cipher appears on government buildings, state documents and on some post boxes. It's also used by government departments and by the royal household for franking mail. Experts think that drinking coffee should be considered part of a healthy lifestyle. Researchers suggest drinking two or three cups a day could be linked to a longer life. The drink was also associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, for the first time, the RAF has admitted that it made mistakes with its recruitment practices after Sky News highlighted claims that it had prioritised hiring ethnic minority and female candidates over white men to hit impossible diversity targets. Our events and security editor, that's Deborah Haynes, of course, broke the story and has more. RAF recruitment has been under fire for weeks. It started when the head of recruiting resigned in protest at an alleged order to prioritise ethnic minority and female candidates over white men. There have also been claims the Air Force inflated diversity figures. Then, over the weekend, a former RAF pilot published a leaked email on his YouTube channel. Just get this straight. If they select based on merit, that's going to be a problem for the Royal Air Force because they have targets they need to achieve set by the Chief of Air Staff. Written by an officer based here at RAF Cranwell, the email from April last year discussed how the Royal Navy was developing a scoring system to rank candidates according to merit. It said the RAF could certainly use this on occasion, but the email went on. I still hold the view that moving to a merit-based SIFT using scores achieved from assessments for candidates would be problematic for the RAF with huge implications on how we do things to achieve our targets. Finally, the RAF for the first time has admitted there had been mistakes. A spokesperson said, while overall standards did not drop, in hindsight, we accept that despite the best of intentions, some mistakes were made. The RAF is now confident that our approach is correct. However, we are investigating some processes and decisions taken in the past. It would be inappropriate to comment further while this is ongoing. All I would like is an apology for all the young white men out there, the British white men who put a lot of effort into the education researching the service, they got themselves to a level, and I know they did because I trained most of them in my school, to present in front of the Air Force and they were never given the opportunity, primarily only because of the colour of their skin and the, the sex they were born. Sky News's Kay Burley earlier this month repeatedly asked the head of the RAF what has happened to those responsible for the recruitment practices. We will do that without any drop of operational standards. We will be very clear. Post, we will be very clear about how we how we uh, how we ap approach any attempts to widen that pool of talent, talent widen our diversity, and we will continue to, to protect the nation. Uh, we we will secure our skies and, and patrol our seas. As the RAF focuses on its core business of defence, an inquiry has been launched following the resignation of the head of recruitment. More details are expected to emerge once that concludes. Deborah Haynes, Sky News. That was an exclusive story first revealed by our own Deborah Haynes. Obviously, we'll be keeping an eye on how that story develops. Also keeping an eye on what's happening here at Labour Party conference, expecting the leader to speak at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We're hearing that the speech has uh, been hastily uh, rewritten, given what's been happening with the economy over the last few days. And, of course, 
last Friday when we had that mini budget that wasn't a budget, wasn't very mini for a lot of people, was it? I put all of that to Labour's Shadow Health Secretary earlier on today. He said that the uh, government is gambling with other people's money with the economic plan they set out on Friday. And as several mortgage lenders pulled products amid speculation, the Bank of England will raise interest rates. West Streeting appealed to them to think of those trying to get on the housing ladder. The withdrawal of uh, mortgage products tells us uh, about the extent to which the Chancellor, our own Chancellor in this country, has frightened the markets and, 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 and as a result lenders having to change the offer they're making to consumers. This is just the tip of the iceberg. What about today and tomorrow and the next day? What are you saying to the lenders? Well, I'd say to, I'd say to the lenders, uh, I appreciate the Conservatives have made your job so much harder. I appreciate you need to revise the products that you're offering consumers as far as you can. You know, remember the fact that just over a decade ago that the country helped financial services out of the massive black hole they'd dug themselves into. In so far as you can, with the conditions the Conservatives have given you, please do your best to look after consumers at this time. Think about those families that are worried about their mortgage payments, really want to get on the housing ladder, have been scrimping and saving to get that first deposit, to get on that first rung of the housing ladder, and now can see that dream of home ownership slipping away. Do your best to support those families. But my, my central message, because I'm not interested in opposition, uh, and, and what we're saying today, I'm interested in what we want to do after the next election. The cavalry is coming with Labour. There we are. And not mincing as well as this is our um, set here at Labour Party conference, but we thought we'd take the opportunity to have a little wander around. As I said, Keir Starmer will be speaking at two o'clock this afternoon and we will uh, be chatting um, leading up to that. And of course, afterwards, tomorrow's here. Um, so Keir Starmer, what's he going to say? He's giving his big speech this afternoon, mm -hmm. and Maybe obviously, need that a bit it's higher. always going to be it's going to be entirely focused on the economy. Labour insiders saying that he relishes this fight on policy with Liz Truss, and will say that it's now Labour who is the party of sound money, and the Conservatives have relinquished their reputation for economic confidence. He's saying that they're the ones who cannot be trusted with the public finances. The charge that's often thrown at Labour. So that will be the crux of his speech. I understand there will be a big shiny new economic policy in there that we haven't been told about uh, in advance. But I think the key thing for today is there's a real air of confidence at this Labour conference that because of the events of recent days, uh, of course, on top of everything that happened with Boris Johnson, they're in with a real chance. They've got a 17-point lead in a YouGov poll this morning. We haven't seen those kind of numbers in a couple of decades. And he now needs to use this moment to set out his stall and say, I can be the next Prime Minister and convince people outside this hall because Labour have had full storms before where they thought they were on the brink of power. But after losing the last four elections, he now needs to say he is the person who can take them forward. And he'll be quoting Tony Blair saying that Labour is the political wing of the British people, saying after their crushing defeat in 2019, the party has now changed and he thinks that they can now win back people's trust. OK, let me relieve you of that if I may. I just want to show you um, around a little bit of where we are. So all of these uh, are stalls that have decided to come along to Labour Party conference. We particularly, I don't know if you were looking at my Twitter feed uh, yesterday, but this uh, van uh, featured uh, on my Twitter feed. We couldn't find a quiet place to record a voiceover for our package that you saw at the top of the show. So these lovely people from Royal Mail allowed us to get into the van, I bet it's locked, yes it is, um, allowed us to get into the van to record our voiceover. It's uh, an electric vehicle, it's a 3,516, they're hoping to have 5,000 by the end of the year and uh, something like 400, uh, 45,000 vans are on the road hoping to uh, replace all of those with electric vehicles uh, within the next five years. So talking more to uh, Obviously, they'll tell you a lot better than I can. The Royal Mail also speaking to the NFU as well. And uh, I think Osdor, yeah, one of the unions is here too, chatting to them and also speaking about green energy and saving the best till last. A guide dog for the blind will be joining us also on the programme a little bit later on. So all of that to come. Looking forward to that. Before that, though, um, how do you feel about spaceships uh, slamming into asteroids? Here's more. These are the last few images taken by a NASA spacecraft seconds before it smashed into a five million tonne asteroid. And we have impact. You can tell by the celebrations back on Earth the crash was no accident. The DART mission 
is the first test of a potential planetary defence system to deflect dangerous asteroids from our home planet. NASA chose their target carefully, a small asteroid orbiting another 7 million miles from Earth. DART approached the asteroid pair Didymos and Dimorphos at nearly 15,000 miles an hour. It aimed for a head-on collision with 160 metre wide Dimorphos. Cameras on a buddy satellite called Leecher Cube recorded the impact and the cloud of debris. The hope is the crash will slow Dimorphos' orbit, but it will take months of observations to prove it has worked. Immediately, they'll be looking at how much debris is ejected from the asteroid after impact. The more stuff we come out, the more we move. Um, and the campaign to understand that and how much we've really, uh, you know, how much we've moved it will happen over the next year. And there's actually telescopes all across the globe that are going to be looking at uh, Didymos and Dimorphos and trying to understand how much uh, we've changed uh, over the next year. If an asteroid the size of Dimorphos were to hit Earth, it could destroy a city. It's not the size that is, you know, going to end life on the planet but it's large enough that it could cause a significant problem if one that size was ever discovered coming towards Earth. And so being able to do something about that seems like a very sensible technology to have. No known asteroid larger than 140 metres is expected to collide with Earth in the next century, but only 40% of the smaller asteroids have been found. So if DART proves to have been a success, more campaigns to study and track space rocks will be needed to spot danger early enough to leave enough time to knock it safely out of the way. Tom Clark, Sky News. Um, moved uh, a little bit further down um, in the hall here, just behind where the cameraman is. That is where we'll be hearing from the leader a little bit later on. And just to make me feel at home, I don't know if we can have a look at this. We've got, we've got Big Ben and the Palace of Westminster just behind looking resplendent on the Google stand here. Uh, but that's not why we're here. We're here to talk to the um, Deputy President of the NFU, Tom Bradshaw. Hi, Tom. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us good on the morning. programme this morning. Tell us why you're here. Well, it's a great opportunity to us to make sure the relationships are strong, lobbying on farming's behalf to make sure that food production really is front and centre. And we're at such a critical time with the food inflation that we're seeing and the production challenges around the world because of the Ukraine crisis. So I think it's really important that we have this dialogue with government and with the opposition. And uh, yeah, it's a great time to be here. Tell me what sort of challenges your members are facing. We, we, we all know the cost of living crisis is facing everybody and energy is driving that. And energy is such a poor, an important part of food production. And so it really is. I mean, we know that uh, on farm inflationary pressures are over 28 percent over the past year. Um, and that's in massively increasing the cost of production. And with, right from eggs and poultry uh, through to, to milk production, there's many challenges there. And a lot of that is also driven by the Ukraine crisis, which was responsible for over a third of the wheat exports globally. And that really is pressurizing the uh, commodity markets and the wheat markets markets higher, which means that the feed costs for your poultry and your pigs are much, much higher than they have been, and really squeezing uh, the cost of production and making it much higher, and then uh, the margins are difficult to come by. Mm. What about exchange rates? I mean, we're all talking about the pound against the dollar at the moment. I know, and a lot of our, a lot of our um, impo inputs are imported, so the exchange rate is really important from that perspective. But we also, uh, it sets our, our internal market prices. So in some respects, in the sh immediate short term for the products that we're selling, we're slightly insulated from the exchange rate, but it'll make the, you know, the country worse off and people will have less spending power. And so it will go in a vicious circle and ultimately people will be able to afford to buy less. So it's crucial that we do have a strong exchange rate and that we, you know, the, the, the country is seen as uh, being a desirable currency because it will have longer term impacts for us. Do you remember a more challenging time for farmers? No, we've had the COVID crisis and, and we thought that that was challenging. And then where we are now with all this inflationary pressure and, and the real squeeze on the cost of living, you know, our members have to be able to make a margin from food production. And the real challenge we face at the moment is that if we're not careful, food production in this country will contract at a time when globally it's under such pressure. We need to produce more rather than less. And so we are at, at you know, an absolute tipping point And it is crucial that the policies that are put in place really do work for farming and food production so that our members can produce not just today and tomorrow, but into next year here and beyond as well. OK, now explain to me, because you're the man who'll know, this New Zealand trade deal, how damaging is it for British farmers? 
immediately, especially with a weak currency, it, it's not a, a huge threat overnight. But the challenge is, if there is a, a country that's producing more, New Zealand can produce incredibly competitively, they, they have access to some of the tools that we don't have. And I guess we've always said it's a death by a thousand cuts rather than one trade deal. And the problem with Australia and New Zealand is that they set a president. We've always said we believe in fair trade, not free trade. And we believe our members can compete with any country around the world if we're, if we're on a level playing field. But if we're importing product that we don't have the ability to produce here, if it's using hormones, if it's using techniques and technologies that we don't have access to as farmers here, then we're, we're fighting with our hands tied behind our back. So the New Zealand trade deal is one thing, then, it's, then we've got the Australian trade deal. But we know with this government there's an incredible free trade agenda. We are optimistic about our dairy exports and things like that, but only if we really are on that fair, uh, yeah, fair playing field and if we yeah, are, are competing on fair terms. And at the moment, we don't believe that's going to be the case. Can I look at your tractor? Of course you can. Thank you. Tell me about it. Well, so this is just a little um, uh, red tractor. It's about 65 horsepower. I mean, you wouldn't believe it, but this is about £40,000 if you were to buy this machine. Wow. Uh, it's much smaller than most farmers will be using. So, uh, And the cost of these is going up yeah, with, it, with inflation. I guess this is double what it would have been five years ago. And it, does the door open? Of course it does. In you go. Have a look. Um, yep, yep, you get it. Yep. So what would you use this for? Uh, so, I mean, this is the sort of tractor that would be used every day on your livestock farms for you know, uh, scraping out your, your cows and just uh, keeping things tidy, uh, feeding. And so, yeah, I mean, you could do a lot of different jobs with it. And, I mean, it's one of the more basic tractors that we've got, the machines that we have, but absolutely crucial. It's like a Jeep. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of room in here for a guy my size, but... Uh, Are you a farmer by trade? Yes, I am. Yeah, I farm down in Essex. So, okay, what um, do you farm? Uh, all combinable crops, cereal production. And so we've actually been insulated from a lot of the challenges because wheat prices and barley prices have increased. But our fertiliser now is about two and a half times the cost that it was last year. So our working capital requirements are double what they were this time last year. OK, and this would be about £45,000? Yeah, over 40000 I would have wow. thought, yeah. Will it come in a different colour? It can come in many different <laughs> colours, but I, I think we do have the same tractor on stand next week. So. Fantastic. It's good to talk to you. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Let's just wander this way, should we? We're moving backwards. There we go. And uh, as if by magic, here's tomorrow. Let's go this way tomorrow. So, talking about the challenges that farmers are facing. Yes, absolutely. And questions about the Brexit deal, of course, are going to be thrown at Labour during this conference as well. Interesting to hear Rachel Reeves, the shadow chancellor yesterday, saying Labour will fix the holes in the government's Brexit deal. Labour don't tend to want to talk about Brexit very much, but this is going to be a question how they would handle it uh, over the next few days as well. And while there is obviously a lot of optimism in the air here because of the government's woes, Labour would say are self-inflicted woes, we've got We've got two years until the next election, a lot of, a lot of detail to work through. Mm, indeed so. Um, the Tories do exactly the same next week. Lib Dems didn't have a conference. Yes, they had to cancel theirs because, of course, it happened during the period of national mourning following uh, the death of Her Majesty the Queen. And I think they will probably try and have an event in London at some stage, but, the, you know, parties do spend a lot of money on their annual conferences. They have tons of their activists there. It was a real blow uh, for them not to be able to have their conference, but um, Labour and the Conservatives have, have gone ahead and you really do see... It was interesting uh, looking at these stalls. I was hearing from Labour people last night that there are more companies than they've had in a very long time wanting to be here, paying to be here and also wanting um, to have meetings with senior um, Labour shadow ministers. They are inundated, they say, with companies wanting to meet up with um, Labour, Labour people. So they're feeling uh, that all those indications are very good. Yeah. Um, it's the big day today, though, isn't it? Labour's yes, leader Labour leaders, speech. Yeah. Earlier than usual. You usually get it on the last day, which is the Wednesday, but it's today for Sir Keir Starmer. And, look, it, the, the wind couldn't be fairer, in a way. It got a 17-point lead in a poll this morning. I mean, it really set the conference alight last night. You know, Labour people couldn't really believe it. Then you've got... Absolute turmoil Although in the financial he's not doing markets. As well in the polls, is he? he is not in his personal ratings, but the fact that you know what, what I was hearing from Labour people last night is you think where they were in 2019 on the floor, worst defeat in 80 years to get to where they are now. Of course, they have to hold on to this momentum for another two, two years. years. And, of course, inflation could come down, things could change. But they are hoping it's 1995 all over again, and in two years um, they'll be in a strong position. But, of course, you know, a lot can happen uh, in those two years. But this is his chance to set out Labour's stall for him to say, we are ready to go into government, and also to say some things about himself and you know, his personal vision and his personal story. Because, of course, he's only given one leader speech 
in person before. The one before that was on Zoom. So this is... He's still relatively yeah. new to the public. OK. Um, Tamara, thanks very much indeed.